journey of exchanging ideas with like-minded people around data quality, governance of data, structuring and cleaning thereof, and management of data is exciting. Research and development on the latest methodologies and technologies in the field of data analytics, augmented algorithms, machine learning, artificial intelligence from a quality data hub will take MIT CDO to the next levels. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Track 5, Leadership in Action, Lessons Learned, Success Stories. My name is Bob Audet. I am a partner of data management at Guidehouse. Uh, today's session is uh, really focusing on CDOs uh, as really strategic leaders for transformation uh, in organizations that are really trying to innovate data and analytics. I think more specifically, the sort of the focus is on the fast radical change of current digital world and emerging technologies and such as quantum computing and value-driven data science enabling practices and demands really CDO leadership um, and ownership within organizations to really tackle and embrace these new emerging technologies. A couple of housekeeping things. The, the presentation will be available in the symposium proceedings. The video will be available three months later on the MIT CDO IQ YouTube channel. Regarding questions, for those in the room, uh, please raise your hand. Have the mic in your hand first before you pose the question. Otherwise, those in the virtual portion of this will not hear you. So if you could kindly abide by those guidelines, I would appreciate it. Uh, feel free to also in those in the room, and especially those online, use the, the HOVA app to pose your questions. And I am going to briefly introduce one of our, our panel facilitator, uh, Dr. Solomon, uh, is it Jaeger? Yes. Yes. Jaeger. Um, he's a CEO and president of the Pilog Group. And he has a really long and accomplished background. And I'm truthfully sharing some of the highlights because the background is quite extensive. And um, he's a repeat attender and speaker at the symposium. So thank you for coming back. And you know, he really had the vision that really data, data investments would really become the assets of the future. And therefore, the Pilog data was established to really focusing on tackling data issues, schemas, standards, and different types of data-focused solutions. Um, he's defined and launched a Pilog Global Academy that's going to serve as a hub for uh, you know, different industry, best practices, academic developments, focusing on mastering data issues. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Solomon to uh, continue with the conversation. Thank you for the opportunity, Rob. And um, yeah, I'm privileged. I'm glad you started with, uh, you know, in 96, because I want to introduce the panel uh, members here. And uh, the first guy here is uh, Vainant Nortkia, who's part of the panel. But we have to leave somebody at home, so to just to, to guard it for us. So Vainant couldn't come, but uh, he's part of this, and he'll pose some questions, yeah. and uh, we'll cover. And we'll look at some of those questions, you know, and, and get his input on it. But Vainant was actually one of the pioneers that in the 80s, I was with the opportunity to start a startup which developed the South African Air Force system, the Navy system in the 80s up to the 90s. And then we sold that company to British Aerospace and we made a very, very crucial decision at that point in time. And that was the future is going to be data. So we got out of the ERP and the logistics systems. And since 95, we just focused on data. And the whole start off of that, and I think that will come back, and that's where Vainan's background really comes into this, was we started taking the NATO templates, and that became the first sort of e-commerce system in the, in the 2000s, and we commercialized that. And that drove a lot of data quality, because you could put quality into the templates and then pass it on. So Vainan was really a pioneer in developing that. And later through the discussion, we can highlight the templates, but I think that is really core cool to the whole discussion of quality data. And we, just like in mid-90s, I believe we are absolutely a next crossover. 
with quantum coming. And we're going to touch on some of those points. I think it took, and uh, my first introductions to CDO was way back with John and them at MIT, and uh, Larry English and Rich and these. It took us since the 80s, you know, where are we, 40 years, you know, to actually get from digital data to some better sort of stuff. So I hope with the quantum coming, we're not going to take that long because it's, it's on us. So Vainand was a pioneer in getting us through that, developing it. But a small story which I think very few people know. When the English came to South Africa and they took our gold and our diamonds and so in, in 19, 1919, well, 1900s, right at the clever, there was a war right in Natal where the Zulus beat the English one time, way back. And then there was a war one day. And that war, there was three prime ministers in the same war in South Africa. And the one was General Louis Boeta, which is, of course, became Prime Minister of South Africa. The other guy was Winston Churchill. He was a reporter in that war. And the third guy was Gandhi. He was a medical stretch bearer. So with that, I would like to introduce Imad, because Imad, for the 20 years that he's been with Pilot, Imad is, Imad is Pilot's Gandhi because he did a lot of changes, he did a lot of innovations, and therefore this whole change over from the CDO role, you know, into the next, I think we're in capable hands. So for Imad, since he joined us, when was it, 2003, 4 with wow. SABIC, yeah. the task where, you know, the technology was not really there, integrating, uh, was it 21 different plants? Yeah. 21 plus 1 million procurement items, different systems into one SAP instance in 2003. And data was all over the show, and we had to catalog all of that. So he cut his teeth in the practicalities, bring that in. And for all of that work, I'm very, very happy that he got uh, uh, allocated or given, you know, an honoris, Doctor. honorary doctor's degree. So that's, that's him at. So... Uh, that's where I want to stop with the introduction, and I think we need to get into the questions of the panel. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, intro. First of all, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, MIT CDO has been special to us because we have been coming back here all the time. For the last two years, we couldn't, but uh, we made it. Uh, and uh, everybody, whoever is joining and uh, listening in, uh, thank you very much for your time because we appreciate uh, your time. So today's discussion is going to be split up into two different topics. One topic is on the quantum uh, computing, where doctor will fly at 42,000 feet, and uh, you know then I will drop to 36,000 feet, wherein I would be sharing some of the lessons learned, success stories, and also the prescriptive roadmaps for the CDOs. The reason why we split it up, because we need to always have uh, latch on to the innovation and technology, but also be very, very practical about what we are doing. From our vast experience, we are going to share some of the lessons learned and success stories that are purely focused on how other organizations could, you know, transform their businesses successfully. So its first 20 minutes is going to be, we all will be flying 42,000 feet because from that view perspective, where the quantum is going, what is it and how the brain can be connected with the computers, you know, all of that, you are going to uh, you know, hear it from doctor. And then there are a lot of uh, practical examples that I would like to bring in uh, to be successful uh, CDOs because you know we have heard several buzzwords and every year, you have at least 50% of the new buzzwords coming in. And that can really you know, distract you, that can really uh, you know, take you in a wrong direction. But from our experience perspective, we have got a recipe, we have got some of the pointers and directions you know, that we would like uh, you know, all our CDO community to uh, listen to and see what is uh, you know, realistic to implement. Okay. So Dr. Uh, 
the first question is i know it's your your favorite subject uh, quantum computing and uh, you are the first one to present it at cdo iq last year about quantum computing and this uh, year we see four to five sessions on quantum computing so you are pioneers there uh, so would you just you know give a brief idea about quantum computing and also how is it relevant now are there any projects that are uh, being realistic and also the whole uh, you know research that you were following closely following that how can the you know human brain can be connected with the computer so that you know whatever we are thinking that can be you know captured by the computers so can you maybe talk about that i can imat and uh, thank you for that but i want to uh, just say i mean from south africa we've got a, a fellow south african who's really changing the world and um, funny enough we came from the same city uh in south africa and uh, he's really into quantum so it made it easy mm-hmm. what i was thinking you know is actually latching on that's elon musk so a lot of the things that's actually coming to really is is also from there so so that's that's easy so if you look at the basics and let me just cover quickly because uh, from last year and this year i don't think everybody understands what quantum is so if you do forgive me for that but to me there's a next level that we don't really see and i've got lots of discussions i think john is is, is in this room and as i say everything is frequencies so uh, and and i'm going to prove my point because it is so and understanding that is we quantum is actually linking it so quantum is going to be the next disrupt. So what data quality a key issue in these uh, algorithms that's going to drive it. So having said that, we just need to quickly understand uh, you know what is a quantum computer. So if you look at the top screen, that is a classical computer and that is one state, it's either 0 or 1 and it's in bits. So that is as simple and everybody is familiar and if it took us 40 years and there was a question yesterday in the quantum session now where does where, where's the quantum operating systems you know and the lex and all these other system that's going to build on it and everybody say we in a flux state but if you take quantum we need to bring in three different elements which you see on the bottom one and that is quantums are actually qubits and the difference between a qubit is a qubit is not a zero or a one but it's got a probability and it could be anything in between so then that in between of a qubit drives a whole new dimension which is superposition entanglement and interference and i want to go a little bit into that so that you can really see uh, why it's so important so if you take superposition that qubit could be and this is the this is the takeaway that really took me some shocking realization quantum could be it's in all those states until you measure it if you measure it it realizes until then it didn't realize it is in all those states that's why you get the speeds so that superposition could be if you measure it it's 50% a one and 50% a zero or it could be 85% a zero and 15% the one or 15% the 85 that superposition so that dial could be anywhere and if you see if we get to the implementations that's exactly if you can manipulate that you can manipulate the whole probability where it mm. is so that superposition the next one so doctor let me just uh, you know clarify that you are saying that there could be between 0 and 1 there could be multiple permutations and combinations of states Hundreds. so bear, that, bear, bear yeah, with me yeah, okay. bear with me on this so check this one so if you look at the entanglement i think it explains the super superposition a little bit better because entanglement means if you have one of those qubits like on the top left hand corner and it's the one is at the 60 40 when you measure it and the other one is at the 50 15 80%. The entanglement means that the moment you bring two quantums together they entangle. 
And all of a sudden, you don't see the 60, 40, 50, nor 80. You see exactly the entangled result. So if you measure it, and there's two there, you will get what you see in the top right-hand corner. So the fact that there's a 0, 0 state, this could be 25%. A zero one is ten percent. A one zero is forty percent, and a one one is twenty five percent because they're entangled. And if you take that and you take the dials and you can alter that, you can see this whole probability is always there. The full potential is there, mm. but only when you measure it. So it's 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 what Einstein also said. You know, we we we're entering spooky stuff here. You know, these these something and. We'll get a little bit to that. So on the right hand left uh, bottom corner, you'll see if you have one qubit, you've got uh, two, uh, two states, uh, zero or one. Mm. You've got two, it goes to four, three, it goes to eight, four, 16. So you've got n qubits, you've got n to the power n entanglements potentially. So that's why, and yesterday's question was, uh, the fear for quantum computers mm. is they're going to break our security yeah. and cryptics. Let, let's get that one out of the way. And uh, from all this literature, and I must give, give credit, I think this is from the IBM stable, they really hit IBM D-Wave. And this is coming from 3 December Kiskit, is the educational, and most of this, yeah. because it's so simple, I took it from there that we can translate it. But we around at 100 qubits, and they will say it will take many, many years. We actually need a million qubits to start mm -hmm. cracking into. So there's some time. Mm. But I've got another, some other ideas on it. But anyway, so it is in progress, right. So this is entanglement. The third element there is interference. And this is where the kicker skips, kicks in. Because a qubit is not a zero or one. But it is described by a quantum wave function. Mm. And it is a wave. That's why it's got the probability to be a zero or a one and oscillating in there all the time. And if you measure it, it takes a position. Mm. But if you've got two or you put three qubits next to each other, you've got three waves. And because of entanglement, the wave gets absolutely driven to one. So it's an overall wave function. Mm. And waves, if you don't go into the whole wave potential, you've got constructive interference, you've got destructive interference, you've got noise, you've got all sorts of mm. other stuff. And maybe this is where this spooky stuff started to interest me. In the 70s, when I was busy with in my engineering degree with physics three, the one day we got this thing that, uh, and, and actually my mother said atoms and so on, they will one day find out. Atoms are not, you know, this electrons and protons and stuff. No, they're made up of smaller stuff. And really, later, it was, it's quantum. It's, it's quarks. Mm. And if you take quarks, it goes to quantum. Okay? And in those studies, you already had the whole position, you know, and just, just touching, but it's coming to this interference thing of uh, Max Planck's uh, particle in a box. No, just Google it. The particle in the box, it didn't follow the energy to get out of the box into another position. Mm. No, it tunneled through, and nobody could explain it. And I think we, we, we're getting to that. But in, enough of that. So that's interference. And I think these three principles is really the takeaway that I want to leave, because we need to get our minds away from zero ones and flat qubit stuff, uh, uh, bits, bits too. into qubits. OK. Now. Mm. Where are we? Here's a couple of models. And I don't want to go into this. This really goes a lot. But if you have the typical classical computer, which is a gate, a zero or one, or no gates, that's what we got. And see, we're flying to the moon with that. If you take the quantum computers, you have some that are designed on the gate model. Some of the examples I saw yesterday from the IBM and so on. Uh, it's a gate model where they simulate mm. actually digital, which is what you see on the right hand. Uh, or you get one where it's measurement based. So you tweak this probabilities in the frequency and you measure it. Or some of them adopts this whole principle <laughs> almost sounds like Genesis. At the beginning, everything was empty, you yeah. know, because everything drops to the lowest uh, potential uh, 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 energy state. So they apply that, which is the 
adiabatic quantum computing and look where the state in the system is the lowest and then measure it. And that's a whole thing. So you can see the adiabatic quantum computing, uh, quantum annealing, and these are all different models, mm. not two silica chips. It's, it's, it's a lot more than that. Uh, other models, topological quantum computing. Uh, interesting is the one on the left-hand side where the guys are actually building quasi-particles out of atoms, electrons, and photons and get a quasi-behavior out of that. Mm -hmm. Or, and move, you know, some uh, electron plates and manipulate the noise or screening. So, many models. If you look at superconducting, uh, that's a typical model where they've got a frequency change in oscillation for pairs. Or the one that really triggered me is magnetic. Mm. Because our brains are working magnetically. Mm. So, I mean, our sense of smell, so on, it's a frequency. But we'd yeah. have to put everything back to bits mm. in order to get it, you know. It's like music. When yeah. I was a student, uh, you know, it, it was vinyls. Then we got to this magnetic and disc, so I got rid of it. I got digital. Now my sons are back to vinyl. <laughs> so we went from digital back. So there's, there's a lot of oscillation, and I think we happen. So there's some realizations, uh, linear ones. Uh, that's the topical computing. Uh, there's the physical realizations uh, model that I've said. And uh, uh, linear computing models. Interesting, on these models, you can see it's linear, linear optical elements, which are mirror wave plates, and integrated in photon chips. So they start building computers out of photons and experimenting with that, and look at the takes or the number of photons and the positions. It's mm. not sand. Mm. Okay. So uh, some others, uh, it's trapped, and so you can go on. You, you know, it's, it's really amazed. Trapped quantum computers, color centers, uh, all of these models, the realizations of actually building today, you know, are uh, trapped com uh, quantum computers, Color center computers. Uh, it's the neutral atoms in a particle, which are physicals. And so it goes on and on and on. And I don't want to wave it. I, I think you can see the potential is tremendously on this. What are we going to use it for? Actually simulating. Because it can speed up creating new materials without mm -hmm. all the time of that. And uh, chemical reactions the whole DNA thing, etc. You can speed this up with quantum computers to a tremendous lot, you know. And Earth and these solar panels improving new chemicals and there's lots of stuff where some of these models are actually going. Okay. So you asked me about, you, you know, now that we understand quantum. Right. Last year, our first presentation, which really triggered me, uh, you know, was uh, this one, we, the first time a guy could sit and think, which was a brain-computer interface, where the logic of the mind with neurological vibrational data encoded, uh, you know, into cryptical stuff, got, got actually measured on a computer. Mm. Now, one year later, coming back to Elon Musk. Elon Musk is the co-founder and starter of Neuralink. Why do you think when he started electric cars, take on the industry, ran into battery problems, they, he couldn't wait, so he started getting into the battery business. Now he's driving, he's got electric cars, yeah. self-driving, but he doesn't have the computing capacity. Now, if you think, if the computers does it, are the humans going to be able to cope with this? Mm. So they invested into this, where the human brain is connected to the internet with a device. And that device is really where you're going to interact, and they're busy with that. I saw, I think it's, it's, uh, it's got a name. It's a pick where they've tried this. Mm -hmm. And you can see it. They, they're working on it. Uh, and all of that will be human brain electromagnetic fields translated in the digital world so that we can set, because I think we're in the hybrid state. Uh, talking about Tesla, this is what came out in 14 February the Tesla Jodo chip. 
It's not a full quantum computer, but they ran it to capacity. But it's a near quantum computer, and he already said this year we'll bring out a real quantum computer. And if you take it, calculations with normal computers that will take us 10,000 years, a quantum computing, because it's got all the states immediately, is going to realize that in three seconds. It's 158 million times faster than we are struggling right now. Okay, and that is why I say all of this is creating data. So if you look at that, and I don't want to go in, the Tesla self-driving machine learning, it's yeah. there. And uh, there's software stacks for that. And it's all based on data. And uh, driving machine learning and so on, and the Dojo computer chips is there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it might, I think I've painted the picture. Right. I think we're there. And uh, we need to do something. We can't wait 40 years again, you know, before we get data quality into this stuff that's coming onto us. Right. Maybe I just want to finalize with this one slide. There's one or two questions. Uh, Let's just go on, on this one, uh, and maybe this is making the better crossover because I was checking our time and you mm. gave me 20 minutes and I was going over, so I was trying to run this short. No, it's just... but, but if we take all of this and we think that information is something that's encoded in this quantum state, it's physical because if we measure it, we get it. But in the quantum state, that is teleportable. So Scotty beat me up and that stuff is not spooky stuff from the future like mobile phones I saw in 73, you know, with Star Wars. Uh, now we're there with, with all of this stuff coming because uh, quantum is teleportable. And the human brain, which is electromagnetic, is actually today, because we're in a crossover, we translate to digital. Like my example, you know, we had vinyl perfect frequency sort of uh, music. Right. Then we took it digital to get it cleaner and manipulate it. Uh, maybe we lost some sound. I don't know. That's why my child, my children, so they want to go back to vinyl. Maybe we in this phase. And uh, my question then, what are the CDO guys are going to do with all of this? Uh, thank you, Doctor. I know, you know we were at 42,000 feet and, and it's still evolving. Uh, from the CDO perspective, I think uh, you know, my take is that every conference that we attend, every year that we come with new technology or components, uh, CDOs need to be aware of those but not fully uh, invest into it because uh, the terminology is changing, the technology is changing, everything is changing. So, yes, we will be aware of the quantum computing, but probably we do not have to be ready with that because by 2024, we would have some indications uh, whether you know, the quality of the output that we are expecting out of it, whether that would be reliable or not, and how are we going to apply in which uh, industries because the use cases are different. In financial industry, it is something that would be very much applicable. And um, in the aeronautics as well, it's going to be applicable where you know the, the calculations are uh, in higher volumes, but it might not be applicable in some of the other stuff. But again, supply chain is something you know where you want to bring in disruption. That's also something that uh, we can look at. So there are certain use cases that are that can be considered, but again, all of them are industry specific so uh, you know my view uh, is that probably we need to be aware of it but you know we don't have to take action until uh, we see the infrastructure that is available IBM is promoting it uh, if somebody would like to play with it they can play with it but again just to know uh, you know how it is what it is you know those are the basics of it and there are still you know eight out of ten questions that are not answered yet so I think it is evolving. Okay. And how can the CDOs, in your opinion, how can the CDOs influence this? Not waiting another 40 years, but be proactive. You've got any ideas of that? Uh, using what we've got yeah. and, and, and bridging this gap. Yeah. 
See, uh, Doctor, I want to touch the topic of uh, how the CDOs can be influenci influential or how can they influence uh, the business transformation programs. Uh, you know, because I have heard on many sessions now that there are a lot of uh, do's and don'ts and blah, blah, blah. But I would like to summarize that into three C's, you know. Uh, let me just go to this one. Three C's. Any organization is looking for efficiency and effectiveness. And nothing more than that. Every organization is actually trying to improve the efficiency of their processes or effectiveness of be, be it bottom line, be it the top line, whatever it is. And organizational efficiencies are actually creating these programs, which is the digital transformation, business transformation, or you call you know, any of the other transformation programs. So the big challenges that CDOs have faced is that, uh, first of all, the expectations are huge. Uh, we know of several organizations where they said that, let's bring in a CDO, and he will do the magic. CDO cannot do the magic because, again, the platforms need to be there, all the tools need to be there, the methodologies need to be there, and he must be given time as well. So. We have seen that those CDOs have failed. Within a quarter or two, they could not achieve it. So the first thing that we say is that you communicate. If let's suppose any organization is going through a, a change, and especially the CDOs, CDOs need to communicate. Communicate with you know, the shareholders, communicate with the directors, as well as communicate with the business, and also all the bottom users of it. And Every time they don't communicate it, and the change will not be accepted. Change will not be accepted by the people if you do not communicate. What is it that need to be communicated to the top level? Top level, we need to communicate what are those numbers that we are looking at, what are those functions that we are looking at, improving it, and what is the impact of that on the bottom line. So it's again a value engineering principle wherein either you uh, improve the efficiency of a product or a service or you reduce the cost. So either of them we have to do. So effective communication is important and again that could be via the awareness, via the you know different things. I'll give you a simple example. One of the CDOs joined one of the large organizations in Middle East and he has been thrown literally a hard disk of one terabyte and said that here is the data I want you to transform this data and put it into the systems. Imagine that is how the, uh, the nature uh, of, of, of the thinking, you know, with regards to the CDOs. What can a CDO do with, the, with that? No, we are going for a S4 HANA migration. Here is the data. I want everything to be sorted out, clean, govern. And how can a CDO do something? He had to leave after three months because, you know, what is there in that hard disk, nobody knows. Who is the owner of it? No, the guys already left. And who are the owners? The owners are those guys who have been working long enough in that organization. So that's the practicality of it. And, and, and that's the reason. And sometimes you do not communicate properly and then there are expectations that built up. So in certain uh, organizations, uh, there were some cases where in CDO walked into the organization, worked without a role, you know, understanding all the business processes because the moment you say that he is the CDO, everybody gets frightened. They do not want to share uh, the information. Where are the data sources? What are those things? And everybody feels that we will be exposed because, you know, we are not doing our job properly. And that's the threat. That's the thing that, that, that everybody is afraid of. So in certain organizations, they were smart enough. They said that you pay a visit to the plant, you pay a visit to the corporate office, you pay a visit to the associate office and learn from all of that and then come back and then uh, you know you uh, give us a plan whether you would be able to transform or not. And those CDOs could be successful, made, made it uh, success. The reason for that is they learned, they understood or what needs to be done and especially the gaps and the value leaks is something that CDOs need to communicate. So that's, I say that communication is important, uh, that's the one. And then the second thing is coordination. And all the time, you know, CDO, the moment CDO is coming, IT guys are scared. 
shit scared. They say that, guys, he's gonna now suggest something. Uh, you know, we will have to do that because that's a mandate. If he's given mandate, by the way. And eight out of 10 times, it's not giving mandate to the CDO that failed the whole mission, whole program. So coordination with the IT, coordination with the business, because CDO is only a transformation agent. He is not the guy who is going to do something. He need all the people around him, especially the business IT to do the transformation of it. And then at the end of the day, it's the collaboration of it. And until and unless you collaborate with uh, you know, everybody, you won't be able to deliver it. So those are the three C's that we always uh, you know, suggest uh, that you, know, you do the communication properly, you do the coordination properly, and then uh, you go with the uh, collaboration uh, of, of that. So, and apart from that, you know. So, Iman, yeah. what, you, what you're actually telling us is uh, we won't get away from the basics. Yeah. So, whether the source of this data is now coming from photons, yeah. or the trouble that uh, Elon ran into that he get this masses, lots of data now is to store it somewhere. Right, right. In this hybrid state, what I hear is we'll have to bring it digital so that we can take our yes. current tools, manage it, manipulate Absolutely. it, and then we're back to basics, your example of, here's the disk. Yeah. I think that's what happened there. Here's the disk with all the machine, all the data, this car, whatever, sends it. Now, now do something with it and learn something with it and drive. Yeah. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So the Got intermediate it. stage is, again, quantum. It would come. This is the decade of quantum. That's what everybody is saying. We will see that in a couple of years. But the intermediate stage is that, first of all, digitalize it, and then we can move to the uh, next one. And um, just to touch on that, uh, generally, you know, uh, what is the recommended roadmap or the strategies for the CDOs is something that has been asked uh, uh, several times. Let me just put everything. So. CDOs cannot jump to the conclusions. They cannot say that, okay, I understand this, this is what I assume, and let's move forward. CDOs need to do a proper as-is assessment. As-is identification first, because you know many a times CDOs, when they, when they walk into any organization, they don't know where is the data, what are the data sources. Probably the data is sitting on somebody's desktop. Probably the data is sitting in the archive folder somewhere. So they need to do or identify the, it's a discovery process of as is data and processes. What is the data processes and what is the data quality? What are the system landscapes that are there? So discovery is important. Without doing the discovery, you cannot say that now I'm going to up your uh, you know, ROI by two times or three times, or I'm going to up your uh, revenue by two or three times. You won't be able to quantify it because probably you might not have the data. If you do not have the data, then, you know, you need to bring in, again, a data team wherein the data can, the, the team can supplement and complement the data. And those, you know, data elements need to be verified. So stage one is always, always a discovery of as is, data and processes, whatever the processes that are running in it. And then stage two is, once you discover that, you go through a data health check, data health assessment, data completeness, whatever you call data profiling. And then you would know that whether the data is good enough to be utilized in the program, good enough to build the systems, good enough to build, in, build the BI, good enough for the machine learning or AI, all of that. And today the biggest challenge, if you, if you see the reasons why the programs are failing and especially the machine learning models are failing is lack of data. And that's why uh, the industry has introduced synthetic data. So that at least you can train with the synthetic data and then when you get to the real data, at least it is similar. So you have to curate the data. So the data health assessment is vital for any CDO to do. Be it even, you know, 100,000 records or be it, you know, 1 million records or billion records, you need to check the completeness of that. And many a times we have seen or I have personally also seen with my team is that the ERPs are not configured in such a way that it generates those transactional data using the master data. 
Many a times you miss that. So you need to go back also to the basics of it and go and reconfigure uh, uh, the stuff. And again, one of the other challenges that uh, industry is facing at this point in time is that everybody is buying technology. Like it's a open market, let's go. And the technology companies, okay, uh, not to be taken as an offense, but technology companies, they are giving you the bill of quantity bomb of all the software products, hundreds of products. They sell it, and until next year, you get the renewal invoice or license invoice, you would not know that you know this is what actually you have invested into. My personal opinion is that instead of buying the technology, you know, rent it for a while. Do a POC on that and see that whether the technology is viable or not, whether the technology is feasible or not. If that technology is feasible, then only invest into it. Otherwise, you would invest millions into the technology. And by the way, technology is not going to do anything. It's the, it's the data that is going to be drive because it is a data-driven business that you are looking at, not the technology-driven business. Those days are gone where the technology would have done it. Yes, technology will enable, technology will empower, technology will accelerate the growth, but it's not the only uh, contributor there. So again, my, you know, we have given suggestions and we saved millions uh, of dollars uh, to the organizations where you know, people were just buying the technology because you know you buy a ML framework or AI framework, it's not going to help you. And then uh, the third step, you know, what we say is uh, is the as is data analysis, as is process analysis. Process modeling is important because even if you would like to know the procure to pay process that you want to uh, you know automate or source to pay process, or you know, hire to retire process. There are a lot of things that need to be looked into. And many a times we, when we had workshops, when we asked uh, the process specialist or the process owner to draw something on the whiteboard, it was only four boxes, that's it. Whereas when we finished the project of process modeling, guiding them, it was into hundreds of different processes, level one, level two, level three, level four, level five. Because if we do not know how the data is flowing through the processes, then we will not be able to improve anything. And there is a possibility of RPA, robotic process automation. There is a possibility of introducing you know, AIs. There are a lot of integration points, but until and unless we explore uh, the, the process modeling, we will will not be able to you know pinpoint where is the improvement needed what are the value leaks what are the gaps uh, that's the that's the third point and then the fourth one is that you know you cannot get ROI in a year or two years it's a long term process but short term wins are important because short term wins assure you know the management or the stakeholders or the leadership that they, there is, there are capabilities, you know, within the organization to grow. So look at very, very short term, which is three to six months, and then six to twelve months, and then twelve months beyond twelve months of it. So when we set up any KPIs, let's set it up in such a way that you have short term wins, and then you know you go to the you know mid term, and then the long term wins. Long term wins will take time. And I don't know of any organization which is 100% uh, you know, data quality compliant. And we will not get there because data quality needs to be monitored every day. Every day there must be either improvement or it must stay as is. But the moment it is going down, you need to bring up. So for, the, for those things, you really need to have the KPIs. And in some organizations, uh, uh, the data stewards have been uh, incentivized. Which means that if you improve the data quality month on month or quarter on quarter, you will get these incentives. And those are really the right things because a CDO will not be able to improve the data quality. CDO will be able to put down only the methodologies, processes, and the measures and the metrics. The data quality need to be, need to be you know, uh, contributed by the end users. And only once we have the data quality, we'll be able to move to the uh, next steps. So the process optimization is another one. And then sometimes, you know, we have seen that, I'll give you an example of it. Uh, one organization, they said that we would like to now um, bring in RPA, robotic process optimization, and then 
they built their data sets, they cleaned it and everything, they implemented it, which is the entire procure to pay process was automated. And within a month's time, all the, maybe, you know, about 20% of orders were placed wrong. Why? Because the data quality was wrong. Yes, you, you really cut a big cake, you celebrated it, but down the line, you are actually losing a lot. So, don't touch the functions that are risky. And they were spending about uh, a billion dollar uh, a year, which means that maybe 20%, 20 million dollar they were spending on the right stuff. And the orders were placed since it was automated. So instead of going into that kind of fully automation, because everybody wants fully automation, but human intervention is required during the pilot phase in order for us to prove the point and then only the fully automation, uh, you know, you can go for a fully automation. So that's also the lessons learned. And, and now that uh, they understand it, they don't implement everything across the group. They go with the pilot, you always test it and test it and then you move to the uh, next one. And then uh, all the time business performance me measurement is important. We need to measure. And if we do not measure it, the stakeholders, the leadership, nobody is going to believe. And the numbers is what the board is looking at. The numbers is what the shareholders are looking at. The numbers is what everybody is looking at. And we have seen some organizations, they generate the reports of business performance improvement with some numbers thrown and it's been displayed across the organization so that everybody is aware of this is the change because of this change these were the numbers that actually improved and then uh, the last but not the least is that orchestrated still there are a lot of organizations who said that they have digitally transformed but there is a lot of manual effort involved so orchestration is something wherein you augment all the methodologies or the technologies, whatever is required for this, that process to automatically acquire the data, automatically uh, harvest the data, automatically identify the data, whatever the data is, and then move forward. So that's those are the uh, you know seven steps that we have. Thank you. you know. Thank you for that, Imad. I just noticed, you know, looking at this, yeah. we had CDO conference, and we should learn here. So yesterday, I saw a guy putting up step eight. Oh. He said monetize. Oh, you see. So really, let's let's just Agreed. check in. So we'll add one and say monetize. Absolutely, that, that becomes a big Absolutely. story. Here, it yeah. seems to me. But I'm just checking the time. I think you covered a lot. You, you know, if we get this masses of data in, you know, and we say we need to stick to the basics. All right. Uh, we cannot get away from this. All right. The, the, the one question that just came to mind, and that leads on to some of the topics. Last year, uh, I did a presentation with Reach, and that was on the data washing machine. Right. Now, some of the work that we're doing here uh, with the universities is the whole engines for entity resolution. Like you say, there's lots and lots of right. tools and tools and tools. Right. So entity resolution is one. The automatic washing machine is like you want to put a couple of knobs your, right. your example of uh, automation. Right. You want to walk away and you want to get this clean stuff. And, and it seems to me that won't happen. So my question, taking what's coming up with the whole quantum world, whichever models is going to win right. and play out in future, and dump this masses of data, do you have any view from, from our expertise what the role of ontologies yeah. And, 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 and sort of basis of hierarchies and actually trusted values will be just to bring sanity if right. we want to automate that and, 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 and to what extent should the CDO actually right. be adopting that? You've right. got any views on that? Yeah, absolutely. See, now the CDO is looking at all the different uh, types of uh, data objects. Now the important thing is metadata. I think, you know, within this uh, symposium, we could see only one metadata session. Um, but actually, metadata is important, you know, the data about data, the data dictionaries talking about it, ontologies, the taxonomies mm. of it, what defines it. Probably it's very easy in, in case of business partner where customer, vendor, uh, employee, and, you know, chart of accounts and, and some of the other stuff is easily doable. Uh, with a limited metadata, but if you go into a uh, you know asset uh, 
centric, uh, heavier set driven industries, the metadata of uh, all the equipments, the metadata of all the materials, spare parts, uh, services, uh, maintenance plans, and that's actually a massive thing. So the ontologies are actually contributing a lot. And uh, today, if you look at it, there's only one standard that is supporting this, uh, you know, which is ISO 8000 standard. And the principles of ISO 8000 standard still are applicable whether you apply it onto the quantum computing. Thank you for that. So I'll have or, a job. Yeah. Or you apply it onto anything else, but the ISO 8000 is something. And there is very, very, you know, uh, less awareness about it. It's very least standard, I'm sure everybody is, uh, you know, aware of. So ISO 8000 standard is evolving and supporting standards are 22745 is there, 29002 is there. And all these standards, I mean, uh, let me just give you another analogy. Why are all the accounting practices around the globe are same? Because they apply a standard. Standards bring in consistency, standards bring in transparency and all of that. For data, are there any standards? That's what is also the question many times we have been asked. There is a standard, but are people using it? They are not using it yet. But until and unless we use the standards, ISO 8000, ISO 22745, 29002, all these other uh, standards that are complementing it, we will not be able to have a foundation of the data. Because all these standards are talking about metadata, all these standards are talking about master data. So, if you look at the stack of it, if your metadata is wrong, your master data will go wrong, 100%. And master data is wrong, your transaction data would go wrong. And what we are doing, what all these days the, the experts are doing is that they buy a BI tool and they run everything on the transaction data. But transaction data itself is wrong. So you cannot get to the analytics without having the right transaction data. To have right transaction data, you need to have the right master and metadata. And the foundations have been left and because you know we are uh, bombarded with all the technologies, all the buzzwords, all the methodologies. But my uh, take is that ISO 8000 can address several of these things because it is evolving. It's not something that is uh, you know, discontinued or inactive. It is evolving and that can help uh, establish the data quality. I think so, especially because it's going into the uh, 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 what is the secure systems that we're getting right now. Um, Encrypted, yeah. Uh, it's, Crypto, it's getting into that, yeah. yeah. It's, it's getting I'll, into I'll, that. So. Uh, I'm just checking. I mean, we can no, talk and talk, I but maybe, yes. maybe there's some questions uh, that it's obviously. If you have questions, you can post it. We will definitely respond. There are. Thank you for your uh, your talk so far. I have a question. You know, we're used to governing and managing and regulating around domains, right? This is, you know, some sort of a regulation. But one of the topics you brought up is just bleeding edge, that brain to machine interface. You're slowly getting into thoughts about what you did, thoughts about what you might do, and thoughts that thank God we choose not to do because we're rational human beings, right? <laughs> but that could be all over the place in data. Where do you see the role of the CDO and the regulators in that sort of data domain. Want to take a no, step of that? But again, because it's all over the show, I think the, the safety net would be where we are as humans. Because I think we, we, we're sitting this, if you look at some of that, and if that's what you were hinting on, we get these transplants, uh, you know, and all of a sudden uh, you would be able to communicate with a machine I think it will be a short step with another un human being, you know, exchanging thoughts. Right. Uh, and that's where it's heading, you know. So I think that's the scary part, which probably we not ready for it. So maybe we need to park the safe haven, you know, my little secrets, and I put it in a digital box and give you a, you know, a reader, and then you read what I think you should be reading. But I, I think that that's going to go away. I think if you really say where it's going. It's interesting when I saw uh, Musk investing into Neuralink, that guy's got an idea. I mean, he didn't go to space just to show NASA it could be done cheaper. It's about control. 
and I think we, we're heading there. So, uh, again, the question on the data side, I think you might can touch on it, but right. I think we'll have to work through the, the quality side, my, my thinking. But it's coming. It's not just the quality, it's the compliance and compliance the governance. And exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. One of these good quantum computers in breaks your encryption and now gets whatever you came out of. You know, it's right. really interesting. Just a comment. Thank you, by the way. So, you know, um, listening to you, one of the challenges I have is just trying to build new data pipelines for these powerful analytics engines. So now my analytics engines are more powerful than ever before, right? I've got predictive algorithms that are now a commodity. I can buy a library and they're easy to access and they're fast and they scale. I'm trying to feed those capabilities today and it's hard to bring data to those capabilities. So I'm, just when I feel like I'm getting close, you guys come and say, that's nothing, right? I'm about to, what did you say, 40 <laughs> times? hundred times, the analytics is going to get even stronger. Yeah. So I'm thinking, how in the world am I going to get, I can barely feed the power I have today. How am I going to feed that power that's going to demand it tomorrow? Yeah. I, I think, and you know, I do some bike riding and one of the trips was going down in South Africa into the hell. That's where, for some years, many years, people lived there. But here's the shocking thing. For 100 years, people could live in that in isolation without exposure to the rest of the world until a bulldozer came. So a bulldozer came later and it took a guy some time to actually get a road down there. And, and now it's open, so we, we can go down there. So the man-machine interface was, uh, are the bull, is, the, is the bulldozer bad? Should the guys be there 100 years? Or the bulldozer is actually good. But it has to be managed. So I think what you're stating is, if you look at this, this is frightening. When I discovered, I mean, the quantum computing, and it's here, 158 million times faster. Are we going to be able to cope with it? Forget about it. Uh, are we bulldozers? No. But we'll have to know the levers of the bulldozer. And I think that's where the challenge is and what you might just displaying. We need to get into this and be in charge of it like the science fictions. Are the machines going to control us or are we going to control the machines? And I think it becomes a question in what, you, in what you're saying. Yeah. Great stuff on the uh, quantum computing. I was waiting for you to go into the multiverse there for, <laughs> for a second. Thanks for, for not going there. Um, <clears throat> question for you on... I don't know, it seems like there's a giant gap between what CDOs are currently worried about. I speak with tons of CEOs that are still like trying to get into governance. And right. I mean, right. we've had how many decades of AI and yeah. companies still, are, there's a handful True. of companies that truly have that figured out. When realistically does quantum computing come into play for what a CDO is, is going to be worried about? And then after you answer that one, isn't this a, a nuclear change? I mean, it, this will change how governments are run, cybersecurity. Yeah. On the FinServe side, you win. If you're the only bank on the street that has this, you win. Yeah. And it's unfair. So, a couple of questions. Whether it's unfair or not, last year I was reporting because I did some research, and it was hidden research. There was a paper from Trump's time on quantum computing or quantum, it, it, it was written. I could draw this thing down and I had a look at it. And they were talking about a quantum financial system. And if you look at the details of that, which is banking, which is actually my example of the bulldozer, who's in control of the levers of this mighty machine. People with shovels can't do it anymore. So the whole banking system of that is, who are these guys in between charging me uh, controlling me, decide what I can do where, compared to, you know, the whole blockchain uh, and, 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 and crypto, I think it's coming. And we need to have the right tools to actually, if I want to deal with you, what's the value? Let's do it. Because it's between you and me. And I think it's like, and that's why I pulled this analogy of the CDO. I mean, it took us 40 years or not, 20 years, last years. And like you say, we haven't moved because we sit with this inertia. But quantum is going to push us immediately because it's just going to dawn and we'll have to adapt or die. But good, let's move that 
And I think that was the whole purpose of this, right. was to bring the awareness and say, hey, guys, there's more to this than just, you know, fiddling around and have some meals here. All right. Thank, Thank you for that. I think, we're, uh, I think we're out of time. Thank yeah. you guys very much. Uh, great, great presentation.